Ewan here again with an editorial that might be playing to spooky season in my own little way. Yeah, I know, Scariest Batman Comics is a thing that we've just done, but what if I told you there was a comic so scary we couldn't put it on that list? All-Star Batman and Robin. I'm talking about All-Star Batman and Robin. You struggle to find a name in comics that courts as much reverence and controversy as Frank Miller. The writer slash artist revitalized Batman in the 1980s with works like The Dark Knight Returns and Year One, and presided over acclaimed runs on Daredevil, Wolverine, and later creator owned works like Sin City and 300. At the same time, his legacy, while unquestionably influential, has been marred by a series of controversies over the last few decades. From bizarre tirades issued against the Occupy movement in the late noughties, to the obvious racism of Holy Terror, Miller today is simply not the Miller of yore. And yet he keeps finding work, with DC evidently eager to rehabilitate the creator's image and capitalise on the nostalgia there is for his classic and indeed seminal works. Except, regardless of his own public controversies, Miller has also struggled critically over the last 20 years. The Dark Knight Strikes Again was touted as a long-anticipated follow-up to The Dark Knight Returns, but it was poorly executed, and is today considered one of the worst Batman comics in the modern era. Likewise, further forays into Batman and Sin City also proved to be divisive, while 2019's Superman Year One is quickly cementing itself as one of the most peculiar reads of the year. For all the faults of Miller's recent bibliography though, one comic stands out above all others as being the most brazenly offensive. All-Star Batman and Robin, The Boy Wonder. DC's All-Star line was meant to pair the medium's biggest talents together, and when they twinned Miller with superstar artist Jim Lee, it was heralded as a match made in heaven. Miller would flesh out the world he created in The Dark Knight Returns of the comic set decades earlier, while Lee would get to continue his hot streak after providing art for Batman Hush, which had concluded in 2003. Only the result proved to be anything but. By the time it had finished in 2008, All-Star Batman and Robin was considered among the worst Batman stories ever told, with Miller's characterization of the world's greatest detective drawing ire from pretty much every corner of the character's fanbase. Lee's art was impeccable as ever, but Miller had gone completely off the rails, leading the charge in a version of the Dark Knight who reveled in violence, ableist slurs, bizarre sexual encounters, and what would probably be considered child abuse by any lawyer or court worth their salt. The end result is something that is quite impressive, but for all the wrong reasons. All-Star Batman is an all-star mess, and quite possibly the worst comic ever to feature the Cape Crusader. Let's get into it. Now, for all it's worth dunking on All-Star Batman, it's equally worth examining the trajectory of Miller's efforts beforehand. Today, his name commands as much respect as it does controversy, for good reason. But for a long time, he was rightly considered a legend of the medium. His run on Daredevil was groundbreaking and influenced pretty much every other interpretation of the character thereafter. Sin City remains a standout independent publication, and his work on Batman, although frequently overcredited with restoring the character to his darker roots, is rightly lauded as some of the character's best. Mainstream narratives tend to over-exaggerate the transformative effects of Miller's first DC work, The Dark Knight Returns, on Batman, but that isn't to say it wasn't important. Although key industry figures like Dennis O'Neill, Neil Adams, Steve Englehart, Marshall Rogers, and others had all divested from the Silver Age motif that governed the character throughout the 1950s and 60s, the delineation between their Batman and Miller's is clear. Post The Dark Knight Returns, DC's Bat books shifted from bright blue and yellow to black and grey, with more artists opting to take inspiration from Miller, Klaus Janssen, and Lynn Varley's work on that particular comic. A new visual motif was then adopted, one also spearheaded by Miller and David Mazzuccelli's Year One, and it's there where Miller's influence on Batman can best be seen today. Influence aside, it's also patently accurate to say that both The Dark Knight Returns and Year One are incredible books. The former is a great examination of Batman's enduring legend and how he differs to DC's other heroes, while the latter optioned a now definitive origin for the character. As well as all of that, Miller's Batman was, while well, certainly fierce, a hero at heart. There was no implication that he'd lost his humanity, even while being consumed by his new crusade. He wanted to save people, and he was determined to do so even if it meant putting his own aging body on the line. For all there was a cruel streak to this night, one never got the sense he was off the rails, abusive, or delighted in hurting people. So how did those traits come to define Miller's Batman just a short two decades later? When it started out, All-Star was meant to be the imprint that would marry DC's most popular characters with their most talented creators, free from the restraints of mainstream continuity. Creators would be free to chart a new course for iconic heroes and villains, and for a while it seemed as though everything was going to plan. 
Grant Morrison and Frank quietly marshaled the Man of Steel in the sensational All-Star Superman, and the publisher's other, now cancelled All-Star books were hotly anticipated by readers. Among them included an Adam Hughes-fronted Wonder Woman comic, a Batgirl series from Jeff Johns and J.G. Jones, and a Green Lantern series helmed by Brian Azzarello and Cliff Chang. For all those other projects got fans excited, a collaboration between Miller and Lee on Batman was deemed the imprint's hottest prospect. Miller had the chance to reiterate his credentials after Strikes Again, while Lee had just enjoyed a phenomenal stint on Batman opposite Jeff Loeb. Pairing them together seemed like a no-brainer, even for those apathetic to the duo's respective portfolios. Of course, 10 years on, and it's clear that DC's all-star imprint didn't work out. Those comics mentioned earlier became stuck in a permanent limbo, but the publisher has fashioned a spiritual successor over the last year in Black Label. It's been made with the same intent as All-Star, and while DC threatened to dilute the overall intent of the imprint by bringing in older comics for no reason, it's already proven to be a damn sight more successful than its predecessor. Weird Superman mermaid sex aside, god damn you Frank Miller. For all its potential, All-Star just didn't work. What was meant to be a legendary coming together between two beloved industry figures resulted in a fudged, cringe-inducing Batman story that reads like a complete fever dream with few redeeming features. Situated in the same continuity as The Dark Knight Returns, All-Star centers on a version of Batman during the burgeoning years of his crime-fighting career. He's established and known to the Justice League, but he's yet to encounter any major supervillains. A familiar setting for Miller, you could argue, only there's nothing familiar about this incarnation of the character at all. He's spiteful, moody, and potentially psychotic, so bizarre is his depiction in the comic. The peculiar thing about All-Star is that it doesn't play this version of Batman for laughs either. Miller has the Dark Knight refer to himself as the goddamn Batman all the time, and yet, honest to God, it's meant to be taken seriously. He's just thoroughly reprehensible all around, but before we dive too heavily into what's wrong with Bruce Wayne's characterization, let's take a look at the book's story itself. As mentioned just before, All-Star is set towards the beginning of Batman's crime-fighting career in the same universe as The Dark Knight Returns, The Dark Knight Strikes Again, The Dark Knight 3, and the yet-to-be-released Golden Child. There's a rawness to the character, but not in the way seen in Year One or The Long Halloween. He's currently reveling in his mission, one he treats like a military campaign. The book opens much the same way as all of Dick Grayson's origins do, at a circus performance that goes tragically wrong. Dick's parents are killed, and Batman apprehends the killer. This all seems like fairly run-of-the-mill stuff, until we see Bruce straight up abduct the newly orphaned boy, tell him that he's just been drafted into a war, all the while hurling ableist insults at his direction, and leaves him in the Batcave to fend for himself. Batman even says that, should Grayson ever get hungry while he's out, that he can eat the bats and the rats in the cave. Yep, yeah, nothing, nothing to see here, nothing, nothing at all. Not even when Batman chastises Alfred for giving Grayson clothes and actual food. This is all absolutely normal behavior for Batman, the world's greatest detective uh, to exhibit. All of this sort of pales in comparison to what happens next though, because instead of looking after the child, Batman decides to spend the night indulging in grievous bodily harm, intermingled with occasional bouts of maniacal laughter. He then stumbles across Black Canary, and after assisting her by taking down a bunch of thugs, who are all brutally caught in an explosion by the way, the pair decide to roll around in the rain and get intimate. All the while that unloads the fact they've kept their masks on throughout. And hey, I'm not kink shaming anything here, I just find the act of getting down and dirty after you've given a bunch of people third degree burns in the pissing cold rain a bit weird, that's all. Soon after, we discovered that it was the Joker who employed a hitman to assassinate the Graysons, but the story somehow gets even more derailed than it already has at this point, by focusing on a feud with the Justice League. Miller's characterization of Wonder Woman is hilariously one note, while the likes of Superman and Green Lantern are only present to make the Dark Knight seem cool and superior. Batman's interactions with the League in this book almost makes it seem like Miller is contemptuous of those other characters. The Dark Knight, joined by Robin, finally paint themselves yellow to give Green Lantern a verbal dressing down, and then a physical one when the Boy Wonder steals his ring. Oh, and an admittedly brilliantly designed Batgirl does show up, but does fairly little other than get captured at the end of the comic. The book teases a future confrontation with the Joker, and even an interaction with Catwoman, but all of it ever came to pass. So reviled was the story upon release. Release. So, is All-Star Batman and Robin the worst Batman comic ever conceived? 
but quite possibly, yeah. I mean, it, it's frankly absurd. Whether it be the characterizations of Batman and the Justice League on one hand, or the casual bigotry the comic elicits from page to page. All-Star is also a testament to the decline of Frank Miller as a creative force in the comics industry, with the writer slash artist capping off his trilogy of garish books, The Dark Knight Strikes Again and All-Star, in Holy Terror, a comic littered with horrid stereotypes that was actually intended as a Batman story first of all, before DC decided not to proceed with it. That said, efforts have been made on DC's behalf to reintegrate Miller into the company, with Dark Knight 3 and the soon-to-be-released Golden Child reuniting the all-star writer with his pointy-eared betrothed. Aside from Batman, DC has also given Miller the keys to the Man of Steel on Superman Year One, one of 2019's weirdest comics, and one that sadly also intimates that the longtime comics legend is past his prime. Now look, I know it's one thing to spend 10 minutes dunking on one of the industry's vaunted creators, but it's worth affixing this entire video with the closing comments, or maybe even two. Frank Miller is one of the most influential artists the comics medium will likely ever see. He redefined Daredevil, reimagined Batman, and achieved both feats before bringing Sin City to the fore in the early 90s. Throw in a great Wolverine story with Chris Claremont and several other series of varying quality and influence, and it only makes his modern day works all the more frustrating to approach. At the time of recording, it's difficult to say whether or not Miller will ever bounce back. DC are certainly trying to facilitate a comeback of sorts, but one does have to wonder if Miller's moment has passed by. Is the appeal of a Frank Miller comic enough to keep fans coming back. I mean, evidently so, given the writer is returning with another Dark Knight comic next year, but is it right? The decision to fall back on the Dark Knight universe seems almost calculated and, dare I say it, even safe at this stage. Even with so much talent attached, it might be best if Miller turned his attention elsewhere and tried fashioning a modern legacy away from his past works on controversies. 